We are always delighted to have back with us the head of the Washington Bureau of the John Birch Society, a dedicated and active Mormon who is a minister of that church and a very devout and constructive American, Mr. Reed A. Benson. My fellow Americans, people generally get the kind of representatives in Congress that they deserve. If enough of the electorate have done their homework and are willing to stand up for America, they can eventually expect to be represented by someone like a Congressman Schmitz. Sometimes a congressional district may get representation worse than they deserve. Today there's a congressional district in Louisiana that may be better represented than they realize or deserve. Congressman Rarick received his Juris Doctorate of Law degree from Tulane University in 1949 and was admitted to the Louisiana Bar that year. He served three years as an infantryman in World War II, was captured during the Battle of the Bulge. He was a prisoner of war. He was imprisoned in Würzburg, Germany and then escaped. He was elected a district judge in the 20th Judicial District of Louisiana. I imagine he must have been a fine constitutional judge because one of his first cases was reversed by former Supreme Court Justice Abe Fortas. <laughs> Congressman Rarick is the father of three children. John, Cherie, and Laurie Lee. The mother of those children, his good wife, Marguerite, is with us here today. And wherever she is, I wish she would stand so we can see her. Uh -huh. The Rarick's have two grandchildren. In 1966, you know, Mrs. Rarick, we just introduced you, so don't sit down, raise your hand. <laughs> I'm gonna keep my hand on the speaker to make sure he stays here by the time. <laughs> In 1966, Congressman Rarick was elected as a Democrat to his first term in Congress and was placed on the Agriculture Committee. In 1968, while running for his second term, he came out in support of George Wallace for the presidency of the United States. In spite of the massive efforts to defeat him by his own party, he won re-election. However, when he went back to Congress, the party punished him for supporting Wallace by taking away his seniority on the Agriculture Committee and not giving him another committee assignment, which he could have expected as a second-term congressman. He'd asked to serve on other committees, including the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Now, mind you, the liberal Democratic congressman from this area, Congressman Drynan, a first-term congressman, was given two committee assignments, one of which was on the House Committee on Internal Security. Let me just add here, this country will never be saved unless there are enough people willing to support candidates 
whose devotion first runs to righteous principle before party, power, or personalities. In 1970, Congressman Rarick was elected to his third term. He's been a recipient of various Statesman and Man of the Year awards. I first came to know of Congressman Rarick through some of the excellent materials he was putting into the Congressional record, such as various articles from American Opinion and Review of the News and other patriotic publications. I got the feeling that here was a man who was leaving his fellow congressmen without the excuse of saying that they couldn't learn what was happening. I delivered one of my first batches of some 20,000 signatures on a petition to encourage the Congress to do all they could within their power to get this administration to quit giving aid directly or indirectly to our communist enemies. One of the first batches out of some one million 800,000 signatures that appeared on that petition to Congressman Rarick. In the scriptures, John the Beloved is one of my favorite characters. Today, my fellow Americans, I'm grateful for the warning over the years from Washington, D.C. of one John Edgar Hoover. I'm grateful that today we have in the Congress two members of the John Birch Society, John Schmitz, John Schmitz, and John Russolo. And now, it is my privilege to present to you an American congressman, John Rarick. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reed. I certainly appreciate your fine welcome. It's indeed a pleasure to be back in Boston. This is the third time in my life that I have ever been in Boston. The last time was two years ago when I had the pleasure to speak to the God family and country rally. And the first time was when, as a young United States infantryman, I was shipped overseas from the port of Boston. But it's always good to be back in the uh, eastern part of the United States because at one time, great Americans walked through the city of Boston. Somewhere their ancestors still have to exist. They can't all have moved south and Midwest and California. <laughs> but I don't know how uh, Reed could expect me to well, they really played this dirty joke on me, I think. Invite me up here to dress you again. And then expect me to follow the gentleman from Tennessee, a great patriot and beloved friend of all of ours, Tom Anderson. Because when Tom Anderson is through speaking, there's nothing more really to say or to be said. If Tom Anderson was only a liberal in a turncoat, why, he'd go down in history with even greater distinction than Will Rogers. Because certainly he is a greater humorist and a greater soft cell artist on Americanism than any humorist, storyteller, or public speaker that has ever existed in the history of America. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps this is why the liberal part of the press is so afraid to carry Tom's column, straight talk. But also, of course, it's great to be back up here to meet with so many old friends. I look out and see another distinguished uh, northerner from my part of the country, General Clyde Watts. And it's always good to see that Colonel Lawrence Bunker and Mrs. Anna McKinney are continuing on best they can to try to have dignity love of country and their beloved Boston and eastern part of our country. Before I proceed any further and get into my speech, 
I thought that in as much as the news is now making the announcement that the United Auto Workers have endorsed President Nixon's trade with Red China, they uh, apparently were going to have a lot of Chinese-made automobiles, and this may explain the guaranteed uh, wage bill, which was pushed by Mr. Woodcock. But while we have this word in the United Auto Workers, I thought if there are any members of organized labor present that you would be proud to know that the AF of LCIO, under George Meany's leadership, has printed a wonderful booklet which is entitled, Who is the Imperialist? It's about a 35 to 40 page booklet, hard selling, hard hitting, and probably one of the most thorough brief analysis of the communist problem of occupation and imperialism that I've had the pleasure to read. And certainly those of you who are aware of the captive nations people, who are interested in trying to continue our efforts to free these people from tyranny and occupation, certainly you'll want to get a hold of one of your union people and get a copy of this book. And the wonderful part about it is it's been so long since I have ever heard any of the leaders of organized labor come out and remind their people that the unions behind the Iron Curtain don't pay the same wage scale that our laborers receive in the United States. Not when the average wage of a worker in Red China is $20 a month. And the next time your liberal friend says, I believe in fair trade, free trade, ask them how you can trade in competition when there's nothing that you have that can compete with what is made with slave labor. Coming up, I was happy to uh, almost become disgusted over my newspaper. Right there on the front page was the new heroine of the season. Bernadette Devil. Bernadette's now going to become a mother. She doesn't know who the father is yet, but she says that her morals are private. Well, they must have been mighty public for a long time, and I wish the newspapers would keep her morals private, because certainly I didn't even want my grandkids to read about that. But while some of us, Mrs. Rick and myself, do have two grandsons, we sit back and watch these young people as they bring on the next generation. Bernadette will have to wonder, will her child be white, black, or red? But the reason, perhaps, that she's having so much trouble to identify the daddy it's about like the story of the fellow that backed into the buzz saw and he said he couldn't decide which tooth bit him. I thought today we might talk a little about a bit about the greatest threat to the American people. And I'm not talking about the Communist Party of Russia. I'm talking about the Supreme Court of the United States and the breakdown of the judiciary that's in our land which has already overthrown our Constitution. We just had the re re recent decision that Cassius Clay is a conscientious objector because he only believes that he has the right to kill people he wants to in his own private war. And since he's convinced the Supreme Court that he doesn't want to kill communists, who do you think he wants to kill? But while Cassius Clay goes free to fight again on TV and in the ring, Lieutenant Calley, a young drafted American who fought gallantly for his country in the way he saw it and the way he understood the war was to be fought, still is imprisoned under a life sentence. And they would tell the American people that this is justice. 
Same week the Supreme Court handed down a decision on the Speck case. This fellow murdered eight nurses in Chicago, but they thought there was a technicality that he should have a new trial. The decision wasn't even in writing. I can't blame the Supreme Court judges. I wouldn't want to put my name on anything like that either. And then coming up, I noticed a tremendous news that the food and drug people had just seized 60 truckloads of fireworks the day before the 4th of July. Apparently they didn't want anyone to celebrate the independence of the United States. They're afraid it might give the American people ideas, cause them to go back and read the indictment against the British government, which is contained in that document known as the Declaration of Independence. The seizure by our federal government was said to be under the Hazardous Substances Act and brought about because in the past three years, fireworks have killed eight and injured 41 people. Now, just a week ago in Louisiana, we had a movement on which called itself the Celebration of Life. What it was was a narcotics rock and roll outfit that had moved in in the bio country at a little place called McCray, Louisiana. In attendance just overnight, or estimated to be between 75 and 100,000, as the news always say, youth. Of course, some of them were much older than I am, and I hardly classify myself as youth. But this youth image was there. And even in your papers this far north, you read that the people in attendance at the McCray Rock Roll Festival were openly using and selling every conceivable brand of narcotics from heroin all the way down, LSD in 10 flavors, openly selling it with signs advertising it. It was on the TV, front page, it even made the Washington papers. I guess that was to encourage some of them that felt they might get a better buy to move south. But there was no federal supervision. There was no federal arrests. There were no federal crackdowns. The only big arrest was the tax revenue people seized 12,000 bottles of wine because they didn't have a tax stamp on it. But while they were arresting the wine sellers, young Americans were shooting hardline heroin in their veins right in front of the federal officers who said that was not in their department. Coming up on the newsstand, we read material like this, the heroin plague. Every day on the floor of Congress, some congressman says, the young men in Vietnam are all dope addicts, they're on heroin, we have to do something to stop the drug problem. Books after books. Here is this month's trial, the attorney's magazine for trial lawyers. Great big account on alcoholism drug abuse. Every time we turn around in Congress, we're having another bill introduced uh, to get more money to set up another committee to investigate drug abuse. Why, we've investigated drug abuse to the point we've almost worn the drugs out. But no one seems to know what to do about stopping drugs. Yet while they were so concerned about seizing the firecrackers that had killed eight people and injured 41 the last three years. I wonder how many Americans have been killed and seriously injured on narcotics in the last three years. Well, I had no reply from the Attorney General, John Mitchell. I made a speech and demanded the enforcement of the narcotics laws that are now on the books using the people that are now on the taxpayers' employ and the Narcotics Bureau of our government, Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Been no reply at all. So the only thing I can assure you is that 
there must not have been any civil rights violations anywhere at McCray. Because if any of those dope lines had been segregated, why, they'd have been immediately in with injunctions, and you know they could have stopped that. Our country, our leaders are somewhere upset. They're screaming and talking to you about controlling narcotics. And yet, where are they? They're doing nothing because they want to constantly use the scare to be able to justify raising your taxes more, appropriating additional sums of money, and hiring more and more federal employees. But they won't use what they've got at this time. Well, we in the South <clears throat> have been just crawling with federal officers. Every two-bit racial discrimination charge in the South ends up front page of the newspapers. Our people in, are sued. They're being tried from police officers on that. And yet we can't find the first federal official that will enforce the U.S. government laws on the books to stop narcotics. They all worry about the fireworks, but they don't have any problems about narcotics. And if you think that this doesn't involve you because you live in Boston or you're not in Louisiana, if you think that it's someone else's children and not yours so it doesn't bother you yet, remember it will. Because every time the dope addict goes in the store and shoplifts or steals, every time they hold up a filling station, the price of the product goes on, and it's just another hidden tax. And eventually you're going to know what the real cost of the narcotic addict is because these words like rehabilitation mean your tax dollars for more hospitals with more federal employees to try to <clears throat> re-educate and retrain the dope addicts to return them back <clears throat> to the productive citizen that they could have been if we enforce the laws now before it is still too late. Well, we couldn't get any action from the U.S. Attorney General, Mr. Mitchell. I don't know where Martha was. I'm sure Martha might have even made a phone call. But in Baton Rouge, the U.S. Attorney, who's out of New Orleans, just across the river from McCray, was obviously about because he was speaking at a civil rights organization movement telling them of the great strides the Republican Party had made in full equality for all. But I wonder why he didn't mention about the deprivation of civil rights by the federal government for not protecting even the youth of America against the plague of narcotics. Then the following week we had tremendous headlines. The district U.S. attorney in New Orleans was now a crime buster, tearing up organized crime in Louisiana. He said that he had caught the New Orleans district attorney taking kickbacks from pinball machines. Now I'm sure that pinball machine kickbacks are far more serious crime affecting the youth and morality of Americans than narcotics. While we sit and talking about the pinball machines, Mr. Garrison, <clears throat> I think you all remember that Jim Garrison was a district attorney that attacked the Warren report and said that President Kennedy was assassinated to get him out of the road because he was opposed to escalating the military troops into South Vietnam. It almost seems like a nightmare now, doesn't it? Garrison, of course, has been constantly in his views under the attack of the CIA. And as he said, all the federal government seems to be after him because he still maintains that he's right. And yet while the narcotics activities were going on full foot, the U.S. attorney 
was talking to civil rights groups across the river, but nothing about narcotics. Mr. Mitchell was so busy filing suit against the New York Times and the Washington Post to prevent the release of the Pentagon Papers. Our papers in Louisiana carry a story like this. <clears throat> the New Orleans District Attorney is filing suit to enjoin U.S. Attorney Mitchell from putting in the Louisiana papers the full criminal story and the charges against the district attorney that he had just indicted. In other words, in one instance, we have the office of U.S. Attorney filing suit in the Northern papers to prevent the printing of certain classified material. And yet in the South, the U.S. Attorney is giving evidence in criminal cases to the newspapers to print. <clears throat> you probably will not hear too much about the Garrison case because it's going to be tried now in the newspapers. But those of you who have ever been in court or know anything about the law, I'll leave you with this thought. The indictment against the New Orleans District Attorney, Mr. Garrison, is 133 pages in length. And any time, it would seem to me that you would have to write 133 pages to say that a man broke a law or that he was a crook or that he was guilty of bribery. Somebody is fooling somebody. However we may think about Garrison, about the probe, remember that the Warren Commission was set up under former Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was a Republican. And we must remember that the present president was the vice president under President Eisenhower, who appointed Earl Warren. And the present Chief Justice is another Earl Warren, excuse me, Warren Earl, I sometimes get the names backward, Warren Earl Booger. So if you wonder why a Republican administration would be after a Southern District Attorney who tried to show there was an assassination of a Democratic president, don't ask me to draw the conclusions. It's too confusing. But the crime-busting headlines continue while the narcotics is completely ignored. Might add this, I know nothing about the pinball machine movement, but I can tell you this, that it is most reprehensive and prejudicial in any criminal case for any accused to be violated at least the sanctity of having the chance to be convicted in any court. For those of you who are acquainted with the Parton Hoffa matter will remember that there was a Teamsters boss in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who became a federal witness and was used to convict Jimmy Hoffa to send him to the penitentiary. Recently, the other end of the problem, Mr. Parton got involved with the law and was given a trial in a federal court. His case was found to be so prejudiced because of advanced news clippings and news media flare-up that the trial is going on today in Butte, Montana, over a thousand miles from where the crime is alleged to have occurred. Where, if, if at all, where will the district attorney or the U.S. Attorney and Mr. Mitchell have to go to try Jim Garrison. In fact, are we setting the stage to where it will be impossible for a politician who is out of grace with those who are in power to have to go to a foreign country in order to get a fair trial and not be prejudiced or be able at least to have a jury that doesn't know anything about the case? Leaving Washington the other day, I was amazed to see that under the new American Revolution, 
which is the term that is given by our president to the present Republican policies. You remember under President Johnson, it was the Great Society, and under President Kennedy, it was the New Frontier. Our present president calls his political movement the New American Revolution. And I'm sure it's a first. It's probably the first time we have ever had a president who has openly called for his own people to overthrow their own country. But we abolished, you recall, under the reorganization OEO and VISTA. They have been abolished. They've just been turned around and given a new name. They're now called Action. So the president was appointing the members of his new Action Committee the other day, and they had his picture in the paper appointing one of the heads. This is the Washington Post, which is the Pravda on the east bank of the Potomac. But here was president with his new presidential appointee that will be in charge, you know, of programs like Head Start, uh, Child Advocacy, Youth Daycare Center, fine, dedicated, leading people, Sammy Davis, Jr. And around Sammy's neck, is a great big chain. You can't see it from there, I'm sure. He has a big chain around his neck, and dangling from the chain is his peace symbol, the symbol of the Antichrist, symbol of this execution of Paul by hanging him upside down. And then in his lapel is his gold-clenched fist, the International Communist Recognition Symbol. And President Nixon sitting there having a big chuckle and a nice smile. But if this is bad and you're concerned about little economic problems, I think the other first that just came out is quite significant, and you may find it very interesting. I don't know of any time in our history, the history of our country, when we have had presidents making proclamations through the Federal Register. Let me read you this one. Proclamation 4060, World Law Day, 1971, by the President of the United States of America. A proclamation. It's not very long, signed Richard M. Nixon. It was in the Federal Register this month. But it ends up here, it says, Now, therefore, I, Richard Nixon, President of the United States of America, do proclaim July 21, July 2-1, as World Law Day. World Law Day. I call on every American to reflect that day on the sacredness of the law in American tradition. And I urge each American to join millions of his fellow men around the world in heightened recognition of the importance of the rule of law in international affairs to our goal of a stable peace. Then he comments that the United Nations is entering its second quarter of a century. And he says that one of the most important parts of this World Law Day will be the meeting of Fifth World Conference at Belgrade, Yugoslavia, July 21. I say it's rather saddening to see the president resort to proclamations like a king to serve us peers with our notices, but I'm wondering how many people are aware of the variation of laws in different nations and under different systems of government. I think that if our U.S. president had truly been briefed on the rule of law, the difference between the rule of law of the Anglo-Saxon Western civilization with that of the communist side of the world, that even he would not attempt to bridge the gap to the American people so that we would misconstrue law in the United States or England or in Western Europe with the law of Russia. From the date of the Magna Carta in 1215, the Anglo-Saxon concept of the common law, which is the very basis of civilization in the West, has always been freedom under law, as personified 
by the Constitution of the United States. Such a tradition, I'm sorry to say, does not apply to law in communist countries where the law is used as a weapon by the minority in power to deny freedom to the individual and thus to perpetuate the unnatural system. The foremost communist judicial scholar is Andrei Wyshynski, who many of you may recall from his days in the United Nations. But before becoming a UN diplomat, Andrei Wyshynski wrote the official commentaries on the Soviet constitutional system. And he stated openly, quote, the judicial process is one of the instruments of political struggle, first for the success, then for the defense of the socialist revolution. I hope I need not remind you that the communists in Russia do not call themselves communists. They call themselves socialists, the U.S. SR, the United Soviet Socialistic Republic. They don't know what communists are. That was a word invented to disguise by the New York Times. Now, the interesting thing about the Belgrade ceremonies on World Law Day under the proclamation of President Nixon is that Chief Justice Warren Earl Booger has arranged to be in attendance at Belgrade, Yugoslavia, which is a communist country, and will share a podium with the Chief Justice of the Soviet Union, Chief Justice Gorkin. It's going to be called a moot court ceremony. President Nixon, Attorney General Mitchell, Secretary of State Rogers, are probably or will be very shortly in London where they will attend the American Bar Association meeting. And they have announced that if at all possible, our president, our attorney general, and our secretary of state would like very much to also bridge the gap by being at this great historic significance where freedom under law meets the power structure of using law to deny freedom. Education is the answer, it most certainly is, because perhaps now the true objective of the world peace through law may begin to solidify and tell us where we are going in view of these developments. We need then only remember that peace to the communist, peace to the communist, is a goal that can only be attained when all resistance to the communist drive for world domination and imperialism is removed or silenced. Mr. Vashinsky, the noted communist jurist diplomat, has already codified and placed that statement. For publication, it's available through the book Andrei Vashinsky, the Law of the Soviet State, written by Macmillan, 1951, page 497 and following. World Law Day, 1971. And we wonder why our court decisions have become so unusual, to say the least. Thinking back about six years ago, when I first had the pleasure of meeting Miss Anna McKinney, I was a young judge in Louisiana, and I was speaking at a Congress of Freedom meeting in Shreveport, Louisiana. At that time, I came to the platform to speak, and I had stacks of books. I had to have people help carry the books so that I could use them in a demonstration. I think Mrs. McKinney will remember that speech. I told the people then that daily I was receiving pamphlets, books, all kinds of offers and intrigue by tax-free foundations, which highly incensed me because I considered it as an affront and an effort to try to brainwash me or to mislead my thoughts on what justice were 
even including offers of vacations to go to California and go up in the northern states. That was some six years ago. And of course, the tax-free people have been very successful. All you need to do is to look at your court structures today to find out that that judge would become highly incensed if you had a case in court before him and went up and wanted to buy him a nice automobile or give him a paid vacation. He would be suspicious if you were trying to influence his decision. And yet some tax-free foundation that wants to pay his expenses to go to Belgrade, Yugoslavia, or to go to London for the American Bar Association meeting, well, everyone thinks that's fine because the judge says, well, I don't have Sears and Roebuck, Flashman Foundation, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller. I don't have them in my court. So that this is not bias and this is not an attempt to bribe the court. This is progress. This is developing an improvement for fair administration of justice. 1968, Congress passed a bill which few of you have heard of, known as the Ominous Crime and Safe Streets Bill. 1969, there were certain amendments added because they said the people at home are getting sick and tired of crime on the street. So the taxpayers were going to be asked to upgrade the police by making additional federal monies available to the police officers on the local scene so they'd be better able to arrest and control the criminal. There were two members of Congress at that time that voted against that bill. I was one of them. The other one was former Congressman Maston O'Neill of Georgia. Congressman O'Neill had since lost interest. He says the American people are aren't worth saving until they wake up, so he went home to enjoy himself practicing law. But he had enough courage to vote no on that bill. And of course it was obvious that the minute federal funds go to local police, then the local police become federal officers. Because with federal funds always goes federal controls. Whether it be revenue sharing in any venture, from public schools to welfare to your National Guard, then down to your police officers. But there were millions of dollars appropriated, and the people at home were all told it'll now be safe to walk on the streets because this money is going to be used to upgrade the efficiency of the local police officer. Last March, the LEAA, which is called the Law Enforcement Assistance Act, which is also, of course, the funding group under the ominous State Street and Crime Control Bill, held a meeting at Williamsburg, Virginia, called by the National Conference on the Judiciary, which is an organization funded by the taxpayers of the United States to provide a forum and a meeting place for federal judges. This meeting last March was very unusual, since in attendance not only were federal judges, but also state court judges, state, state attorney generals, the president of the United States, and the chief justice of the United States on the same platform. At that time, the president of the United States made the suggestion that it would be proper and be fine for the state courts of the United States to organize a national state court association. A, rather, a clearinghouse whereby they would be able to train and discipline and encourage the judges of the state courts to rather cooperate and get in step with the federal judges. The money, of course, for most of the expenses and the travel was paid at that time by tax-free foundations. Now, barely two months later, the announcement was made in the Washington Daily News, in your nation's capital, responding to urgent pleas from President Nixon and Chief Justice Warren Booger, the nation's lower courts 
lower courts. If they're state courts, they're now lower courts. Have established a national center for state courts to bring about reform of dangerously bogged down state and local courts. The National Conference of State Courts, which came into being yesterday, this was dated June 16th, is patterned after the Federal Conference on the Judiciary. Well, quite naturally, since it was a Federal Judiciary Conference that originated it. It was organized by six state jurists, headed by Chief Justice James Holden of the Vermont Supreme Court. Later it mentions Associate Justice Paul Reardon of the Supreme Court of Massachusetts. It says, among members of the original organization committee was Chief Justice Robert Clavert of the Texas Supreme Court. So the people who had been worried, including myself, about federal funds going through the emotion of helping control crime was going to end up in a national police force should now be aware that the real threat is going to be a national takeover of all of our state courts. The news publicity even calling now the state courts lower courts. And the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, for one, was in existence before there even was a Supreme Court of the United States. Each of our states, by our own constitutions, have prescribed certain rules and regulations for our own courts. There is only one Supreme Court of the United States. And the Constitution then proceeds to say in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. But certainly it never was any power given to any federal court that it is automatically a higher court than any state court. The federal system, except for the original jurisdiction vested in the Constitution in the Supreme Court, was only allowed to intervene in federal questions. Of course, today we must agree the Educators and the conditioners have done a wonderful job because what is a federal question has been so extended that it can be made to extend in any field. Federal questions today are fabricated and manufactured far beyond the intent of the Constitution of the United States. Let me read to you just a short summary from the American Bar Association Journal on the caliber of money that is being sent out now to educate and to improve the quality of the judges of the United States. The American people now go out in their states and they find a fine young lawyer, an honest one, there's still some of them around. They elect him their judge. Now he's expected to take advantage of one of these tax-free or government-financed uh, excursions so the people can tell him how to handle his court and what justice is and how to rule. And right and wrong certainly doesn't have to be educated, does it? All these people go to the same law school and most of them study the same exams. 1973 force of a billion dollars was funneled into the courts as federal money. Last week, the appropriations bill on the LEAA was 690 some millions of dollars. But on the list it says for the Council on Legal Education Opportunity, $88,000 to sponsor programs to encourage and assist qualified persons from minority groups and economically and culturally disadvantaged backgrounds to enter law school and the legal profession. Now this is money that you're giving in your taxes to make the streets safe for your children and your wives. This is money that is being appropriated to fight organized crime. You know, narcotics, I think that that's organized crime. Pinball machine rackets, like we got in New Orleans after Garrison. It's to encourage planning. The federal government underwrites 90% of the cost of establishing and operating the planning agencies. 40% of the states must be made available to units of local government so they can also meaningfully participate in the activity. 357000 for the Institute of Court Management at the Denver University Law School. 
conduct 10 court management studies of criminal courts and court systems throughout the country, $140,000 to Arizona for a juvenile court center to develop a model management system, $90,000 for a three-phase project in Ohio's Franklin County. The goal is scheduling and calendaring procedures through the use of data processing technique. We're going to have electronic judges now. They also set up a National Institute of Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice Research Arm, a modest $7.5 million for the current fiscal year. So far in 72, they recommend 146 for the Institute for Defense Analysis in Arlington, Virginia. They're going to examine the role of defense lawyers in criminal cases with an effort to see where defense counsel strategy and tactics delay the case to weigh the cost-benefit factors involved. Wait till they get a hold of Kunstler and put him on that machine. Another major factor of making the streets straight safe for the citizen is going to be that of academic assistance. We're now going to grant special scholarships to law students. It goes on page after page after page of money that is being funneled not to help organize crime, but rather to capture judges and to influence justice. I tore this article out of the local Washington, D.C. paper. The Office of the State Attorneys for Montgomery and Prince George's County are among 11 in Maryland to train law student interns this summer under a $15,898 uh, federal grant under the Law Enforcement Assistance Act. In other words, in order to help our local police, we're now going to give jobs to law students and summer employment working in the district attorney's offices. And while I was mentioning to you about the unusual activities in narcotics in Louisiana that I can't even get the U.S. attorney to make a statement on, take any action, yesterday's paper, July the 3rd, Morning Advocate Baton Rouge says federal funds in a crime grant to be used in drug cases. The recent approval of $250,000 grant to the Louisiana Commission on Law Enforcement Assistance of Criminal Justice was made available today to help control narcotics. The federal grant will make it possible for the Louisiana Department of Corrections to recruit 20 additional probation and parole officers. 20 additional probation and parole officers. In other words, the way we're going to handle the narcotics offenders, we're just going to take them out and let them go home again. No one has decided yet that the best way to handle narcotics offenders, especially those who are pushers and sellers, is to put them in jail and throw the key away. You don't rehabilitate them and you don't buy a piece. The eight gentlemen, Tennessee, had mentioned the recent Supreme Court decision denying tax-free status to private schools in the state of Mississippi if they were racially discriminated. I don't know how many of you have followed the interesting analysis of discrimination and race, tax-free status, but while in Mississippi, those parents who have already paid for one school system and now choose to build a second school system and still having to pay for the first one they fled from are being denied the opportunity of their own government to encourage education. In New York City, the Council on Abortion Research and Education is sending out letters asking for financial contributions and it says, all contributions are tax deductible. Now perhaps this kind of a tax deduction is legal because they don't discriminate against who they abort. And have you noticed that all of the people who are for abortion are all opposed to capital punishment? They don't want to execute convicted murderers and rapists. They only want to execute the unborn children. At the same time the Supreme Court is handing down a decision denying tax deductions to Mississippi schools. 
In Washington, D.C., the federal government under the OEO announced a $240,000 grant to the Planned Parenthood Association, which is a tax-free, nonprofit organization, to go to Tennessee, which is Mr. Anderson's home state, and set up a pilot project offering free voluntarily, voluntary sterilization to poor whites. Now that sounds discriminatory too, doesn't it? But then you proceed on with a grant and it said that the reason that this grant was being limited to sterilizing the whites in Tennessee, <clears throat> I hope they don't get a hold of Tom, The reason is, it says, that the black community has not been conditioned yet to accept contraception and sterilization because they regard such activities as genocide by whites against blacks. But I wonder what they think the rest is about whites against whites. And not only is this a tax-free organization, but it's being funded with your tax money. Same time we had the decision on the Mississippi schools, an organization which calls itself a church, apparently for tax-deductible purposes, voted very racistly to withdraw all support to South Africa, to abolish all uh, laws which control abortions. And then in their last synod meeting this month, says the Church of United Church of Christ voted a $10 million emergency fund, most to go to support several Southern colleges, principally educated Negroes. Now, if people in Mississippi can't have tax-free status educating whites, how can a church group in Michigan have tax-free status and giving their money only to educate Negroes? The double standard of our courts is most difficult, and I leave you with that, that the greatest threat that we have today, not from the Communist Party, not even Congress, our greatest threat is from the people who know where they're going, and that is the members of the Supreme Court of the United States. I think that we should never let them forget the things that they have done under the name and under the guise of justice in improving court administration. Nor should we ever let Mr. Richard Milhouse Nixon forget when he says, I have no control. Remember him saying, Mr. Booger is my hand-selected, hand-picked nominee for the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States because I feel we have to moderate the trend the Supreme Court is taking. World Law Day, now by executive order. Yes, most of us live and serve for those we love. In Congress, all the congressmen vote for the people who elect them to Congress. Some of them vote for the one man who picks up the bill. Some of them vote for the one company. Some of them vote for the one group. It all depends who sends them to Congress as to who they serve for. But the appointees that are appointed, who do they owe their allegiance to? They then, too, live and serve for those they love because they are the ones who, feel, they feel, gave them a guaranteed Life, lifelong job, which, of course, is not the way the Constitution reads either. Those who are appointed to jobs will say that they are obligated to the tax-free foundations and to the federal grants that are coming out to them now under your money. But where do these people who operate at high levels, always doing the best they can to spend your money, and telling you what is better for you. Who do these people ever thank? They never thank the people they're really indebted to. 
That's the American people. There's nothing wrong with the United States. Not a thing wrong with our system of government. Not a thing wrong with our people. What is wrong with our country is a small group of greedy, grafty people that will not let the constitutional system operate the way it was intended. <laughs> that was what the 4th of July is all about. Tyranny. And there is no worse tyranny than judicial tyranny. That is what the Constitution of the United States is all about. People power. The Constitution was intended to protect the people from the tyranny that the federal judges are now throwing on their backs. People power, not ruler power. For we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against wickedness in high places. We all live and serve for those we love. We must love each other. Our country, right or wrong, is our country. God bless you all. Good luck.